It was 6am on the 23rd of August in 1961 and on a lay-by on the A6 road in a place aptly named Deadman's Hill, Bedford, two people were shot and left for dead after being carjacked the night before. The perpetrator had apparently no motive to target these two individuals and despite flimsy evidence at best, the man caught was convicted and executed for the crime in April 1962. Yet the case continues to divide because of the lack of evidence and many people believe the man to have been wrongly convicted. Many years later, cutting edge DNA testing technology would once and for all confirm whether or not the perpetrator was indeed guilty and possibly wrongly executed. Hey there little berries and newberries, Eri Berry here, hope you are well, welcome if you are new, welcome back if you are not. This is actually a reshoot of the original video which I filmed several weeks ago, but my PC wasn't able to run the latest edition of Premiere Pro, so I needed a new PC which I now have and a new webcam, so I decided to, instead of using the previous video, just reshoot it. But before exploring the case of the A6 murder, I wish to thank you all for your love and your patience, both before and after the death of my wife um, on New Year's Eve. As most of you come here to see the true crime content, I'm not going to talk about that much here, so I have set up a second channel called Eriberry the Widow Diary, so you can always check that out if you want to learn more about that side of my life. Thank you very much to everyone who subscribed, my lovely little berries, and also the channel members, the Newberries, for their continued viewership and patron, Alison Hempseed, Reality Check, Candy Ray and Alf. A very special mention though goes out to Linda of Checking Convictions who was a Newbery, she was a channel member here, um, but unfortunately Linda died before Christmas and she was such a cherished and loved member of the true crime community on YouTube and she's so well loved by everybody and because unfortunately she can no longer be technically a Newbery, I don't want to remove her tree from the orchard so I have added a special tree to the orchard in honour of Linda and so she'll always be there with us. If you want to become a member you'll be greatly supporting the channel if you do. It's £2.99 a month and you get members only posts and videos, early access, you get shout outs as well and if you want to donate just as a one-off, you can do as a super thanks, or if you don't wish to or cannot contribute financially, just watching is enough or subscribing is more than enough. Thank you ever so much. Let's get into it. The triggers for this case are carjacking, murder with a gun, rape, capital punishment, war evacuation, and suicide. Please note that there's no disrespect intended at all to the families of the victims and of the perpetrator. For many people have their opinions and theories on this case, this case is extremely divisive and I welcome healthy debate in the comments, but please be respectful of each other and the families and friends of the victim and the perpetrator and critique the comment and the view as opposed to the person. It was 6am on the 23rd of August in 1961 and 18-year-old John Kerr arrived at work to perform his temporary role as a traffic census taker. His post was at a place called Deadman's Hill in Bedford on the A6. As John Kerr took up his post, a colleague told him that there appeared to be a woman in distress on the lay-by. John Kerr walked to the location and saw, lying on the ground, two people, a man and a woman. They appeared to just be lying there, as if they'd literally just spent the night sleeping on the ground, which was an unusual sight in itself, yet there didn't appear to be any sign of violence, carnage or chaos. John approached the couple and saw that the man was lying flat on his back with a white rag over his face. He was not moving, but the woman was, and she was lying partially on her side, appeared to be struggling to move and to speak. John Kerr didn't know what had happened here, so he just simply went up to the woman and said, are you all right? And the woman looked at him and said, no, I've been shot. John Kerr flagged down the first car that he could see on the road and asked them to use the RAC payphone to call the police and an ambulance. Knowing that the woman could potentially die before emergency services arose, John Kerr used the back of his census paper and tried to take down as much information as he could from the lady. 
The woman said her name was Valerie Story, and when John Kerr asked if the man next to her was dead, she said, I think so. The man next to her was Michael Gregston, Valerie's lover, and John Kerr tried to feel for Michael's pulse, but there was none, and it was clear that Michael was beyond saving, so he turned his attention to Valerie's story. He noticed some blood, although not a huge amount, so he deduced that any bleeding that Valerie's story had sustained from the shooting had already stopped, so he didn't need to stem the blood or anything like that. Valerie told John that the night before, she and Michael Gregston had picked up a man near Slough. They drove him to that spot. The man had shot Michael, raped Valerie, and then shot her. The man then drove off in Michael Gregston's car, which was a grey Morris Minor. Valerie's story told John Kerr that her attacker was, quote, a bit taller than she was, and she was five foot three. He had large, staring eyes and quote, lightish hair. When the police arrived, John Kerr passed his papers to the police, but they were subsequently misplaced and their whereabouts to this day remain unknown. Valerie's story was rushed to Bedford General Hospital where she underwent emergency surgery. The police were desperate to speak to her because not only did they need the information from her as soon as possible, but she could die whilst in theatre. But the hospital emphasised to the police, look, I appreciate you want to get as much information from her as possible, but our priority right now is to save her. Valerie's story had been shot five times, one bullet hitting her spine and paralysing her from the shoulders down. The paralysis was confirmed as permanent and she would never walk again, but she was nonetheless alive. Michael Gregston and Valerie Story were having a relationship, but Michael Gregston was actually married, and his now widow, Janet, was escorted to the scene of the crime by the police where she identified her husband's body right there. Michael Gregston had been shot twice in the back of the head, and Janet described him as having his face, quote, blown off. Valerie Story had not only seen this crime take place, but she was also herself a victim. Possibly the perpetrator didn't know that she had survived and he'd intended to kill her and thought he'd killed her. But now we will go back to the time before this incident and explain what happened before Michael Grixton was murdered and Valerie Story was almost killed. Valerie Story and Michael Grexton met in 1958 at the government laboratory where Michael Grexton worked as a scientist and Valerie Story worked as a lab assistant. They established a friendship over their love of cars and although their relationship was platonic at first, romance was beginning. Valerie was 19 at the time and Michael was 14 years her senior. Michael and Janet Grexton had two sons, Simon who was eight and Anthony who was almost two years old. Anthony has since said that although he was very young when his father Father died, he remembered his dad as being very warm with a soft voice. Michael and Janet had separated, and Janet knew about her husband's relationship with Valerie's story, so this was not a case of a clandestine affair. He and Valerie embarked on their relationship in the open. Yet Valerie didn't feel that she and Michael Gregston were going to be together forever, and she has said that if what had happened hadn't happened, it's likely she and Michael Gregston would have gone on for around about six months and then would have gone their separate ways. Michael was also very devoted to his two boys and would always put them first, and Valerie Story knew that. Michael Gregston's car was a grey Morris Minor, and on the 22nd of August in 1961, Valerie Story had been at work, Michael Gregston had the day off. They arranged it so that Michael Gregston would go and pick up Valerie at their place of work, which was the Road Research Laboratory in Langley, Buckinghamshire. They then proceeded to a place called the Old Station Inn in Taplow. They had one drink and then left the pub at 8.45 p.m. They drove to a cornfield in a place called Dorney Reach, where he and Valerie Story sometimes met to have sex. It was a very isolated spot, some detached houses scattered, so it was very rural and very remote. At half past nine, while they were parked in this cornfield, just as daylight was fading, a man tapped on Michael Gregston's window and said, wind down the window. Michael did so, and as he did, the man pointed a 38 caliber revolver in his face. He said, I'm a desperate man. This is a holdup. The man was very smartly and cleanly dressed in a suit and had a very thick Cockney accent. The man instructed Michael Gregston to give him the keys, which Michael did, and Valerie remembered that she thought, this must be a prank or something, this must be a joke, but it wasn't. The man got into the back of the car and instructed the couple not to turn round and look at him. He told Michael and Valerie that he had been on the run for four months and not eaten for days and was very hungry. He also claimed to have been sleeping rough for two days. 
Valerie's science training kicked in and she deduced by the man's impeccable and clean suit, which had a clean white shirt, that there's no way that he'd have been sleeping rough for two days. From the glimpses that Valerie's story caught, the man had a cloth over his face from the bridge of his nose downwards. He talked incessantly in his very thick Cockney accent, making small talk and telling Michael and Valerie that he would shoot them if anyone were to come by and see them, but if they cooperated, they would be all right. After a couple of hours in this cornfield, the man gave the car keys back to Michael and instructed him to drive towards London. They drove for a long time, even stopping at a milk machine, but nobody had changed for a carton. They stopped a couple of times to get petrol and the man told Michael at another point to get some cigarettes, even though the man said he didn't smoke and neither did Valerie nor Michael. While Michael was out of the car, he threatened Valerie with the gun and said that if Michael raised the alarm or tried anything whilst paying for the petrol and cigarettes, he would kill Valerie. The Court of Appeal documents state that the journey taken by the occupants of the Morris Minor was rather, quote, a roundabout journey through the northwest outer suburbs. In total, the man was in the company of Michael Gregston and Valerie Storey for six hours. He talked a lot and Valerie took note of his voice, things he said, and she tried to keep as calm as she possibly could. At one point, the man took their watches, but then gave them both back to Valerie as well, which was rather strange. The man said that he hadn't had the gun very long. It was a 38 and commented that he felt it was like a cowboy's gun, but had never used it. He told Michael and Valerie about his life, that he'd lived a rough life, locked in cellars with only bread and water, had been in remand homes and boar stalls. He also said that he had, quote, done the lot and had committed burglaries. The man appeared to change his story a lot, saying that he'd been on the run for different periods of time, saying he could drive all kinds of cars, but didn't seem to be familiar with a Morris Minor, asking how the gears worked. He also acted as a kind of driving co-pilot, telling Michael Gregston what to be careful of and some roadworks in the area. Valerie commented that his voice was, quote, very quiet, very soft-spoken, not a deep voice. I should say from his voice, he was 20-ish. She also mentioned that one marker of his accent was that he would not pronounce the TH. It was think and things, not think and things. There was one point where he told Michael Gregson that he wanted to put him in the boot of the car, and they even stopped the car so that the man and Michael Gregson could walk to the rear of the car. Yet after numerous protests from Michael Gregson, the man allowed him back to retake his position in the driving seat, so they continued their journey. They drove through Slough and onto Harrow, where he accurately pointed out that there were roadworks in a particular area, so he obviously knew it very well. Then the man decided that he was no longer hungry and was now tired and said a number of times that he, quote, wanted a kip, kip being a UK slang term for having a nap. After a number of turns around the Bedford area, he directed Michael Gregston to pull up in a lay-by on the A6, Deadman's Hill. It was pitch black no nearby house, nor road lights, and the man kept saying that he needed to kip. He said that he would need to tie both of his captives up and try to find some rope in the boot, but there was none. So the man asked Michael Gregston for his tie and proceeded to tie up Valerie Story's wrists. The man was also wearing his own tie and Valerie Story suggested that he use his own tie, but the man said that he needed to use it, so he would rather have Michael Gregston's tie. The couple were now in the front seats and the man behind them once again. The man pointed to the footwell in front of Valerie's story where he could see a duffel bag and wanted Michael Gregston to fetch it just in case there were things in there he could also use as ligatures. As Michael Gregston leant down and then proceeded to hand the bag to the man behind him, the man shot Michael Gregston twice in the back of the head, killing him instantly. Valerie's story screamed, you bastard, you shot him, why did you do that? The man said that Michael Gregston had frightened him as he moved too quickly. Valerie tried to implore the man to get Michael Gregston some medical attention, but he refused. The man snapped back at Valerie a few times saying, be quiet, will you? I'm thinking. She noticed the TH pronounces F again, and this phrase was burned into her mind. He said this so many times in the journey and at that point. Be quiet, will you? I'm thinking. The man asked Valerie her name, which he had already asked before. She gave her name and asked the man what she should call him. The man said, well, 
you can call me Jim. Eventually, the man made a request to Valerie that she at first refused. He asked her to kiss him. She was turned around now and facing him, and he had removed the handkerchief, but it was so dark that even though she was right in front of him, inches from his face, she couldn't quite see all his features fully. He told her to kiss him and threatened her with the gun. Knowing that this man was not bluffing, Valerie obliged. But either just before or just after the kiss, a car with the headlights on drove up the road from behind Valerie's story. As this happened, the lights illuminated the man's face. This was the only time that Valerie's story got a good look at her attacker, and it was a good look, illuminated by the lights, and he was literally right in front of her. After Valerie obeyed the man's request for a kiss, still threatening her with the gun, he told her to get out of the Morris Minor. He then told her to get into the back seat of the car on the left-hand side and to get in backwards. The man climbed in after her and proceeded to rape her. When it was over, Valerie tried to get him to go and leave her alone, and she wouldn't tell anybody, but he once again said, be quiet, will you? I'm thinking. The man ordered Valerie out of the car and told her to drag Michael's body out. She did as instructed, but it was very awkward for her and she asked the man for help. He at first said no, but then after she insisted, he did help her, but with very minimal effort. Valerie said that it was as if he was trying very hard not to get any blood on him. The man asked Valerie to start the car and show him how the gears and lights worked. The car engine cut out and she repeated the process of starting the car again and showing him how to operate the vehicle. The man got into the car and Valerie sat down next to Michael Gregston, who was lying flat on his back. The man then got out of the car, walked around to the left-hand side, prompting Valerie to once again implore him to please go and leave them alone and she even offered him a one pound note. He told her that he would have to hit her on the head or something, which Valerie's story said would be unnecessary because she wouldn't report it. The man began to walk away and for a moment, Valerie's story thought that maybe she would be left unharmed. But instead, the man walked about two to three meters away from her and just as he turned back to face her, he shot her. Valerie's story felt a bullet hit her, followed by another, and when the second hit her, she felt her whole lower half go numb. The man fired two more times, reloaded, and then fired three more times. Valerie's story was paralyzed from the shoulders down, so she couldn't tell how many of those bullets had hit her, but in total, she had actually been hit five times. Valerie's story slumped down on the floor and tried her best to stay perfectly still, even holding her breath. She felt the man approach her, kick her with his foot just to see if she was dead. Seemingly satisfied that she was, the man got into the car and Valerie heard the grinding of the gears as he drove away. He drove the car in the direction of Luton and this was around 3 a.m. on the 23rd of August in 1961. Valerie Story tried to flag down many vehicles using her petticoat, but she could barely move and was on a lay-by shielded by tall grass so barely anybody could see her. She lay there for more than three hours before she was discovered by John Kerr. After Valerie Story relayed her harrowing tale, the search was on to find the person who attacked her and had killed Michael Gregston. Janet Gregston had to break the news to the two boys that she had with Michael Gregston that was obviously as devastating for all can imagine that that their father unfortunately was not going to come home. Janet even visited Valerie in hospital to try and get more information about what had happened to her late husband. The police, however, didn't need to wait long before a report came in that Michael Gregston's Grey Morris Minor had been spotted. It had been parked rather badly in a place called Ilford, which at the time was part of Essex, but is now in the London borough of Redbridge. It was reported to have been seen at around 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. along Eastern Avenue in London. A man called John Skillet and his friend and fellow passenger Edward Blackhall noticed how erratically it had been driven. John Skillet caught up with the Morris Minor at a roundabout and shouted abuse at the driver. Skillet reported to have had a good look at the driver's face. The vehicles were parallel for just a few seconds and Edward Blackhall also was said to have had a good view of the driver's face. 
and did say that they would be able to recognise him. The men described the car as a grey Morris Minor and gave the registration number, confirmed that the car had three red stripes on the rear bumper, and there was a quote, torn green label on the back windscreen. The latter two pieces of information are not unique with Morris Minors, but the registration number given closely matched Michael Gregston's. Shortly after the car was spotted again on Redbridge Lane East, a man called James Trower had driven to that road to pick up a friend, and for copyright reasons, I cannot play you the clip, but I will tell you what James Trower said to Panorama in the 1966 edition. Oh well, on that uh, morning, like, I'd come down here to pick up uh, Paddy Hogan, who used to live here, and of uh, course, while I'm waiting for Paddy to come down, I just walked back toward the car. At that moment, a 1956 Morris come thundering up the street here and shot around the corner into Avondale Crescent. That's it, well, I didn't think much much of it really, and uh, well, as I was going to work, I mentioned it to Paddy, and he says something about that uh, bit of a dodgy road round here, and I said, well, if they all drive like that, it must be. You see, so never thought no more of it. Away I went. The car stopped at Avondale Crescent, and James Trower looked at the driver for a few seconds and said that the man was wearing a dark jacket with a white shirt. The man James Trower was going to pick up was Patrick Paddy Hogan. However, Hogan gave a very different story when speaking to Panorama. Yeah, well, on the morning of the 23rd, I was uh, standing at the street door waiting for my friend to go to work at around 6.45, and I was reading the morning paper, and uh, there was a car past me. I glanced up at the car. It was a Morris Minor, a Mo- beg your pardon? A Morris 1000, a uh, colour was grey. I happened to glance up at it as it went past, and it went into Avondale Crescent. And a uh, reporter, just round the corner, Hogan, just round the corner from where I live, yes. And uh, I didn't take much more notice of it there. Paddy Hogan said that James Trower wasn't waiting for him, but that Paddy Hogan was waiting for James Trower. Paddy saw the Morris Minor being driven fast and badly down the road and turn into Avondale Crescent, and he also got a good look at the driver. Both men swore that their respective recollections were definitely on the date in question, but they both can't be correct if indeed referring to that same day. Trower is certain that Hogan got the days mixed up, because the day before, Hogan was waiting for Trower. Both men say that they were on their own when they saw the Morris Minor being driven erratically, and they both got a good look at the driver. In Avondale Crescent, where the vehicle was eventually apprehended, a resident of the street called Doris Atho reported to have seen the Morris Minor at around 7am that morning. All these sightings have been greatly called into question. Was it really Michael Gregston's Morris Minor that was seen? The car was indeed found in Avondale Crescent, which corroborated what Doris Atho, James Trower and Paddy Hogan had said. But whether or not this was the car that was definitely the Morris mine in question that was witnessed by Skillet and Blackhall at one location and Trower and Hogan at another is disputed. Michael Gregston's Morris Miner was impounded and forensically tested. It had been wiped clean of fingerprints, there were no fibres, no hairs from the perpetrator. This indicated that the killer was forensically aware, and this must not have been their first offence. Not only is murder very rarely a criminal's first offence, they must have been aware that fingerprints could be traced. The man was also very arrogant, having parked the car in a residential street in Essex in broad daylight. The following morning, a bus cleaner called Edwin Cook was carrying out his duties at a bus garage in Rye Lane. Edwin had cleaned bus number 36A the night before and always made a point of checking the back seat on the top deck of the bus because the back seat could open, revealing a cavity underneath, and many people discarded rubbish and goodness knows what there. The night before, he checked under the seat, he cleaned it, everything was fine. The next morning, which was the 24th of August in 1961, 24 hours after the murder, Edwin Cook lifted up that seat and he made a startling discovery. Far from the rubbish that he was expecting to find there, what he found was a 38 calibre revolver wrapped in a handkerchief. Edwin called the police and ballistics confirmed that this was indeed the weapon that had killed Michael Gregston and severely injured Valerie Story. Like the Morris Minor, it had too been wiped clean of all fingerprints. Of course, no prints could be lifted from the handkerchief, but because it was said to have been used by Valerie Story to cover the man's face, it too was kept and stored. With a lack of forensic evidence and not a very clear motive, the police had very little to go on. But with the help of people that cited the Morris Minor and Valerie's story, identikits were drawn up and broadcast, which both look 
rather different, but the general description was the same. Roughly 30 years of age, medium build, about 5 foot 6, dark hair, deep set brown eyes. Both had a feature in common, which was one eyebrow was raised higher than the other. Just before the identikits were published, the police put an appeal out to any hotels in London that had anyone staying with them that acted suspiciously. A man called Peter Louis Alphon was reported by hotel workers at the Alexandra Court Hotel in London as Alphon had not come out of his room for five days. Now, this was just six days after the murder that this was reported. Alphon was interviewed and he confirmed that on the night of the murder, he was at the Vienna Hotel in London. The Vienna Hotel was investigated and Alphon did stay there, but under an alias of F. Durrant. But because Alphon had only gone on the police radar for just staying in his room for several days, there was nothing to implicate him in the murder, so that wasn't actually followed up. This was until the 11th of September in 1961, when in room 24 at the Vienna Hotel, the same hotel at which Alphon had stayed, two gun cartridge cases were found, and ballistics confirmed that they were indeed fired from that 38 caliber revolver. The cases were under a chair next to a bed in an alcove in room 24, and the police looked at the details of the person who had stayed in that hotel, which included Peter Alphon. After discovering the cases, the police made a public appeal to Peter Alphon to come forward. Before this, though, the Vienna Hotel porter gave a statement to the police saying that Alphon had stayed in room 6. That was not the same room in which the gun cases had been found. At this point, Alphon was not known to any member of the public, including the Vienna Hotel staff, as being of any connection to the A6 murder. But after the police made the public appeal to Alphon to come forward, the porter changed his story and said that Alphon had stayed in room 24. Alphon went to the police, he was questioned again, and the porter was also questioned again, and he confirmed that his original statement of Alphon staying in room 6 was in fact the true one. He had changed it to room 24 after the public appeal. Despite Alphon having stayed in the same hotel at which these cases were found, albeit in different rooms, there was no other evidence linking him to the crime. Still, the police had to do one more thing to either confirm or eliminate him from their inquiries. Alphon was placed on two identity parades. The parade for the eyewitnesses took place on the 23rd of September 1961, and although John Skillet did not attend this parade, a petrol attendant that filled up the Morris Mine at midnight during the course of the carjacking did attend. Nobody on either parade picked out Peter Alphon. Nobody on this parade picked out Alphon or indeed anyone else from that lineup. The next identity parade took place at Guy's Hospital the following day for Valerie Story. Valerie Story also did not pick out Alphon. She did, however, pick out someone else, someone who had only just volunteered for the lineup, someone completely innocent. This person has never been identified, but Valerie Story said that the reason she did this was because she felt pressured to pick someone out. She picked out someone who just looked like them. In an interview with Panorama, she described this mistake as being, quote, one of those things. With no evidence linking Alphon to the crime and not being identified by anyone on the parade, he was not arrested so the police were back to square one. The only connection they had was the Vienna Hotel, so that's where they went back, specifically room 24. They looked at the details of the occupancy of room 24 and showed that someone by the name of Jay Ryan had stayed in the room on the 21st and 22nd of August in 1961 just before the murders. Jay Ryan had given his address as 72 Wood Lane, Kingsbury. However, the evidence at this address showed that a J. Ryan had never lived there. Therefore, the elusive J. Ryan was an alias, or he had given the wrong address, or both were false. After J. Ryan vacated the room, it had been unoccupied, and it had remained unoccupied until those casings were discovered. There was another tip involving this elusive J. Ryan. Eight days after her husband was murdered, Janet Gregston went to work at her brother-in-law, Bill Ewer's antique shop in Finchley to help take her mind off things. At this point, the identikits of the perpetrator had made their rounds on the news, happened to be looking out of the window of the shop when she froze. She pulled at her brother-in-law's arm and pointed out the window at a man whom she was certain was the person who had killed her husband. This was extraordinary because if the identikits had made their rounds and Mrs. Gregson was no more than an eyewitness than the general public, why would someone that looked like the perpetrator be walking around unconcealed? Why hadn't anyone else identified them? 
why was it Mrs. Gregston, who wasn't even there in London, which is huge, even in 1961, of all people, why would this person be outside the antique shop? Bill Ewer thought nothing of it, but the next day, he was in a cafe near his shop when he saw the man again outside. Bill exited the cafe and followed the man and thought he'd gone into a photography shop, but the man wasn't there. He couldn't find the man anywhere, so he called the police. It had been put out on the media that the police were looking for a Jay Ryan and the address that he had given to the Vienna Hotel. A man from Ireland called Gerard Leonard contacted the police that he had met a Mr. Ryan who had hired a car and with whom he had taken a number of driving trips in Ireland quite recently. Gerard Leonard described the man as being, quote, slightly reckless driver and had been in Ireland for about a week from the 4th of September. This Mr. Ryan had stayed at a place called O'Flynn's Hotel and he had given the same dress as the police had put out on the media, 72 Wood Lane, Kingsbury. This Mr. Ryan had asked Jared Leonard to write some postcards to his relatives for him because Mr. Ryan couldn't write anything more than his name. One of the postcards was addressed to a Mrs. Hanratty. Going back to the very coincidental sighting by Janet Gregston and Bill Ewer, Bill reported that he'd seen the man go into a shop on a particular road and thought it to have been a photography shop. When Bill went into the shop, the man wasn't there. So when he called the police, the police scoured all the shops on that road and interviewed shopkeepers and staff. On the day of the sighting, a man called Jim Ryan had indeed gone into one of the shops, which was a florist, and there he had ordered a dozen red roses to go to a Mrs. Han Ratty of 12 Sycamore Grove, Kingsbury. Accompanying it was a note that said, don't worry, everything will be all right. This Mrs. Han Ratty was J. Ryan's mother. J. Ryan was indeed an alias. His real name was James Hanratty. James Hanratty was born on the 4th of October in 1936 to parents James and Mary Hanratty. He was the eldest of what would become four boys, Michael, Richard and Peter. His father, James Hanratty Sr., was in the army and not at home very much, and in 1944, James Hanratty Jr. and his brother Michael were evacuated to Inverness, Scotland. The two brothers were very close, and James was particularly protective of Michael. When the brothers were met by prospective foster parents during the evacuation, they only wanted to take James, but James refused to go without his younger brother, Michael. In the documentary Murder Casebook, a criminologist called Professor David Wilson observed that James Hanratty's childhood was dominated by three main factors, an absent father, war and evacuation. This would have been traumatic for him and may have played a large part in his development. When the war was over, James and Michael returned to their parents. James went to secondary school in 1947 and was known for being a dealer in sweets and ration books, as rationing continued way after the war. It didn't stop when the war stopped. However, when it came to schoolwork, James Hamratty was lazy and not interested at all in learning. He barely learned to write more than his own name and school described him as, quote, retarded and uneducatable. The term retarded is not something we use now medically or um, in terms of academics. It's now more of a slur, but that's what they wrote at the time. In today's language, he would be described as a child with learning difficulties, developmental issues, and requiring special education. James Hamratty's family were told that he would need such a special education, but they refused to place him in a special school and made him go to a normal school. This was not the ideal environment for him. He struggled immensely. He was popular, with his school friends and he didn't cause any of his school friends any grief, he wasn't a bully or anything, he just wasn't interested in learning. At the age of 15, James Hamratty left school and got a job at his father's place of work collecting rubbish, but it wasn't what he wanted to do and he found it very, very boring. On top of having to deal with his father being absent for much of his childhood, the war, evacuation, difficulties in school, not receiving the care he needed and finally an unfulfilling job. When he was 16, a very significant event occurred. While riding his bike, James Hanratty had an accident and was unconscious for 10 hours. After this, James behaved very differently to how he had been before. Before this, although he had a job that he hated, he stuck at it and he had a fairly good routine and was law-abiding. He also looked out for his siblings, yet when he was recovering from the accident, he did something very odd. He stole all the family's ration books, used them to buy sweets, gave all the sweets to his younger brother, Michael, 
and then took off. For several weeks, his family were searching for him. He, he was a missing person. He was eventually discovered in Brighton. He was working as a road hauler there, but he was found in a very, very bad way, suffering greatly from exposure and was not taking good care of himself at all. The pay from the job was not enough to ensure that he was well looked after and he hadn't gone to his family for help. And that's where he was found and taken to hospital and then his family were informed where he was. James underwent exploratory brain surgery and some sources say that no evidence of brain injuries were found, but there was a suspected hemorrhage. Despite no evidence of brain trauma, James Hamratty was nonetheless described medically as, quote, mentally defective. After being discharged from hospital, after this very difficult time in his life, James Hanratty turned a major corner, but not in a good way. He declined to go back to working in the refuse company and decided to pursue a new career as a criminal. It's possible that this bike injury may have been instrumental in bringing about his sudden change of behaviour, which he may have been predisposed to given his childhood trauma and brain developmental issues. At the age of 17, James Hanratty stole a motorbike and in September 1954 was convicted of theft driving without a license and insurance. For this offence, he was put on probation and received some psychiatric treatment. Shortly after, James Hanratty had an assessment to see if he could go into the national services, but was illiterate, so he was not deemed fit to go into the national services, so that was not a career he could go down. A year later, James Hanratty was convicted of housebreaking and theft. For this, he was sentenced to two years in prison. He was 18 at the time and was placed on the youth wing at Wormwood Scrubs, where he attempted suicide by slashing his wrists. James Hamratty was treated for his wounds in the in-prison hospital, but he was also reviewed by their psychologists. He was described as being, quote, a potential psychopath. Two more convictions with custodial sentences followed, one in 1957 for stealing a vehicle and driving without a license. For this, he was sent to Walton Prison and was suspended for driving for a year as soon as he were able to pass his test. At Walton Prison, he was actually diagnosed as a psychopath. Nowadays, that would be antisocial personality disorder, but at the time, psychopath was a recognized medical diagnosis. James Hamratty served four months of that six month sentence and very shortly after, he was convicted once again of stealing a vehicle and because he was technically disqualified, and this was his fifth driving offence, he received a longer sentence. He served three years from March 1958 to March 1961 at various prisons, from which he attempted to escape a few times. A researcher in Maidstone Prison described James Hanratty as having, quote, gross social and emotional immaturity. After being released from Strangeways Prison, his father, James Sr., used his pension to set up a window cleaning business to try and help his son get a good career, responsibility, and to ensure he stayed close to his son and on the right side of the law. When James Sr. and the two younger sons went on holiday, they left the business to James Hanratty Jr. to run. But he got bored abandoned the business and left for Soho to live the good life. James Hamratty had become acquainted with many other criminals in both London and other places in the country, particularly Liverpool, where Walton Prison was situated. He learned how to get rid of stolen goods without being detected and where to go to fence items, etc. One criminal associate was Charles France, whose daughter Carol had dyed James Hamratty's auburn hair black as a disguise on the 5th of August 1961, which was two weeks before the A6 murder. Hamratty was so committed to his career as a criminal that he did not want his distinctive hair seen as red hair would narrow down suspects a lot more than dark hair. And he intended to continue his career despite four convictions and three custodial sentences behind him. So he had no intention of reforming, even taking measures to stay away from prison. Carol also tinted James Hanratty's hair again on the 26th of August, 1961, three days after the murder, as the dye was fading and his hair was growing. A few weeks later, he had the hair tint removed and then had it bleached. He intended to have his hair go back to its natural auburn, but instead it made his hair a very unnaturally bright orange, so he was even more distinctive. But he didn't have that bright orange hair at the time of the murder. What he had was regrowing auburn hair underneath his dyed black hair, which was at the time fading, so his hair would have looked dark. But it was confirmed through James Hamratty's friends, family, and even ex-girlfriends 
that James Hamrati was never violent, never in his personal life, nor when it came to committing crimes. However, starting out small and increasing to violent crime is usually how a career plays out in the criminal world. Some purpose have history of violence going back to childhood, and James Hamratty didn't have any in his childhood. It was only after that accident that he started to steal things and break into houses. Stealing and motoring offences wasn't considered to be, quote, violent crime but they do harm people. They take away people's livelihoods and a housebreaking quite often involves violence to get into property or if not bodily harm and driving without license is indeed risk to life. But had he now graduated to commit murder? As they did with Peter Louis Alphon, the police put out an appeal for James Han Ratty to come forward for questioning. This prompted Han Ratty, under the alias of Jay Ryan, to make several calls to the police to lead detective DC Acott taunting him and refusing to come forward. Hanratty claimed that this is because he had already committed several other house break-ins and was wanted for them. Hanratty was alleged to have said, quote, I know I have left my fingerprints at different places and some different things and the police want me, but I want to tell you that I did not do that A6 murder. In another conversation in October 1961, he claimed to be calling from Liverpool. Further investigations into Han Ratty showed that on the 8th of July in 1961, giving his parents' address, he ordered a suit and obtained it on the 18th of August in 1961. He wore it for an entire week after this. This was significant as Valerie Story described the man as being, quote, natally dressed in a very smart suit. Yet all this was circumstantial and the police needed to speak to Han Ratty to establish his movements and what he did or did not know about the murder of Michael Gregston and the rape of Valerie Story. A warrant for James Han Ratty's arrest was made in October 1961 and he was identified at a cafe in Blackpool. After this, he was placed on the identity parades. John Skillet and James Trower both identified Han Ratty. However, Edward Blackhall and Paddy Hogan did not identify Han Ratty. James Trower and Paddy Hogan, who saw the car go into Avondale Crescent, gave very conflicting accounts, which could not possibly have been of the same event. They both say that on the day of the discovery of the Morris Minor, one was waiting outside for the other. Trower said he was waiting for Hogan outside H Hogan's flat and saw the Morris Minor. He got a good look at the driver was able to identify James Hanratty. Hogan said he was waiting outside for Trower to pick him up and he saw the Morris Minor. Like with Trower, Hogan did see the driver. However, Hogan says it definitely wasn't James Hanratty. After identifying the events of seeing the car, Trower described seeing the police at Avondale Crescent and that Trower had told the police what he'd seen earlier that day. Trower said the following to Panorama. And then, uh, a little time passed and I had to uh, go down and identify the person who I picked out as James Hanratty like. Hogan then had the following conversation with the Panorama reporter. Reporter, did you get a good look at the man who was driving it? Hogan, with a nod. Yes, yes. Reporter, did he look like James Hanratty? Hogan, no, no, it wasn't James Hanratty at all. I'd notice I'd seen the bloke distinctively and he wasn't James Hanratty. That much I can vouch for. And uh, the chap I'd seen was, as far as I can recollect, was dark-haired, clean-shaven, um, wouldn't like to estimate his age, but uh, as far back as I can remember, he was, that was the description of the bloke. I wouldn't like to say whether he had glasses on or not, but it wasn't Han Ratty. That much I can definitely vouch for. Hogan's story was put to Trower, and this is what Trower said. Trower, well, then Mr. Hogan has got two mornings mixed up because the, f the morning before he was waiting in the street, that particular morning I had to knock for him, you see? That's where I think he got, I mean, everybody gets mixed up, we know that. Why he's got more or less with you might be well the excitement. He's got two mornings rolled into one. Reporter. But in your mind, there's no doubt that it was that morning. Trower. Well, in my mind, I picked out the person who I seen. Reporter. And when you saw him in court, did you recognise him again? Trower. Well, when they asked me in court, I just pointed to the accused and that was it. It was then put to Paddy Hogan about James Trower's suggestion that Paddy Hogan had got two mornings mixed up. Hogan. Well, I don't go on dates a lot. I never have done. I go from day to day as regards to working conditions, but on this particular morning, um, I don't uh, remember the exact date, but I do now remember I was waiting at the door to go to work and uh, Mr. Uh, according to the evidence Mr. Trower gave was that he was waiting for me outside the door. Well, I was waiting at the door 6.45, and Mr. Trower hadn't been near to my place until about 10 or quarter past 7 on that particular morning. Reporter, you're sure it was that morning? Hogan, 
I'm definitely sure it was that morning, no doubt about that. These two accounts conflict with regard to the description and identification, but both men are certain that the day they saw the grey Morris Minor was definitely the morning in question when the car was abandoned in Avondale Crescent. When Hanratty was taken into custody, he was asked to provide an alibi, which if proved true, would be an absolute confirmation of his innocence. Hanratty told the detectives that on the 20th of August 1961, he had stayed with his friend Charles France, and then at the Vienna Hotel on the 21st and had taken the train to Liverpool on the 22nd of August 1961. Carol France, Charles France's daughter who had dyed Hanratty's hair on occasion, confirmed that Hanratty had swung by their home again on the 21st of August 1961. She remembered it specifically as she had a dental appointment and he had left the home at 7pm on the 21st of August in 1961 and returned to the Vienna Hotel. Then he said he stayed in Liverpool having left the Vienna Hotel at 9am on the 20th 2nd of August in 1961. In Liverpool, he had stayed with three friends who were supposedly former prison mates of Hanratty's for a few days before coming back to London. However, he refused point blank to name these three friends as they were criminal associates and would not corroborate his testimony, he said. He nonetheless said that he had a, quote, perfect alibi, although not giving the information to the police, even if just a slim chance that it might help him, that didn't strike the police as being perfect. The authenticity of what James Hamratty actually said in his interviews has been the subject of many disputes which we will revisit later. He admitted to having inquired to owning a gun as soon as he came out of strange ways in March that year, and wanted to use it to do stick-ups, as he put it, and had aspirations of becoming a stick-up man. James Hamratty was allegedly not a violent person, but like I said, violence is usually a progression. And even if he did not procure a gun, he expressed a desire to use a gun. Hamratty told the police that after he arrived in Liverpool, he sent a telegram. The police officers say that Hamratty told them that he'd sent the telegram on the 22nd, but Hamratty said that that was all a misunderstanding and he told them he sent it on the 24th. Evidence showed that it was indeed on the 24th of August 1961 on which he'd sent a telegram, which was at 8.40pm that day. The location was a place called St George's Hall, just across the road from the train station in Lime Street, Liverpool. However, the telegram sender was noted as P. Ryan, and the address given was the Imperial Hotel in Liverpool. The telegram read, Having a nice time, be home Friday morning for business, your sincerely, Jim. So there was evidence that he was in Liverpool the day after the murders, even though he confirmed a different address from which the telegram was actually sent. But this did not prove that he was in Liverpool on the 22nd and 23rd of August 1961. The suit which Hanratty had bought from Hepworth had been recovered by the jacket. Hanratty said that he disposed of the jacket because it had become damaged when committing burglaries. The suit had been worn a lot from when it was purchased to when it was seized, including the 26th of August 1961. This was the date on which Charles France said that Hanratty had returned from Liverpool to London and he was wearing the suit. When it came to the identification parades, what was heavily criticised was that Hanratty's hair was a brilliant bright orange which made him conspicuous. This point was later made by his defence team, who said that Hamratty stuck out, quote, like a carrot in a bunch of bananas. The criticisms were that people on the parade should have been wearing hats to cover their hair, because his bright hair would have drawn people to him, even if he wasn't someone who had committed something people would still be drawn to him, and they found that that was unfair. On the 14th of October in 1961, an identity parade involving Hanratty was conducted at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where Valerie Storey was continuing her therapy and recuperating. On her hospital bed, she was moved up and down the line. It went on for quite some time, about 20 minutes she was moved up and down the line. She got a good look at each person, but still wanted something from each of them. She wanted them all to say, be quiet, will you? I'm thinking. Hanratty, with his thick Cockney accent, pronounced the TH as an F and said, thinking. Valerie Story later said she couldn't say whether the others had Cockney accents, but she said as soon as Hanratty said the line, she knew it was him. She looked at him, she looked in his eyes, he looked back at her. She knew that he was the man who had raped her and had killed Michael Gregston. She also said that him looking back at her, he knew that she knew. 
After this identification, Han Ratty was charged and placed on remand awaiting trial. During the trial, it came to light that a fellow prisoner had said that Han Ratty had confessed to the crime, but the testimony of the witness was highly questioned. One witness who gave a very interesting piece of evidence was Charles France. He had been deeply, deeply troubled by Han Ratty's apparent move from lesser crimes to the ultimate crime. He alleged that Han Ratty had been on the 36A bus with him before and had insisted on going to the top deck to the back and he had told Charles France that the back seat of that bus lifted up and the cavity was always a good place to store stolen goods. So that had stuck in his mind because that was exactly where the murder weapon was found. James Hamratty protested his innocence and repeatedly said that he was in Liverpool at the time of the murder, so he physically could not have possibly committed the crime, but he still refused to name the people that he was with at the time. His trial was expedited by having it been moved from London to Bedford, the place at which the murder occurred, which began on the 22nd of January in 1962. The trial took place over 21 days, which at the time was a record. A total of 83 prosecution witnesses, 14 defence witnesses were called and 3 rebuttal witnesses. Hanratty was described as being arrogant, not really understanding the magnitude of what was happening, not appearing to take it seriously, although he continued to say he had nothing to do with the murder. Hanratty was only charged with murder and not rape, nor carjacking, nor car theft. This is because the charge of murder carried the highest form of punishment, death, so this was the only thing for which Hanratty was charged and tried. 12 days into that 21 day trial, despite saying for months, I was in Liverpool, I was in Liverpool, but I'm not going to give you the names of the people. James Hanratty changed his alibi. He wasn't in Liverpool at the time of the murder. He was in Rill, which is about 40 miles west of Liverpool, across the border in Wales. He said he was there on the 22nd and 23rd of August in 1961, but had lied and said that he was in Liverpool because there would be nobody that would be able to corroborate his whereabouts in Rill. Even though he refused to name the people he was with in Liverpool, apparently nobody knew he was in Rill. He was also alleged to have gone to Liverpool after the murders, to bribe certain people to say he was with them, but they refused his bribes. This change of story, even if proved to be true, greatly damaged Hanratty's defence. Changing his alibi only proved he was a liar and not a reliable witness. The timeline of events that James Hanratty gave were as follows, and I will now refer to my notes. He left the Vienna Hotel at 9.30 a.m. on the 22nd of August in 1961. He intended to go to Euston Station, but a walked from the hotel to Paddington Station, so he took a taxi from Paddington to Euston Station, where he got the train to Lime Street in Liverpool, which arrived at 4.30 p.m. that day. Hanratty had a criminal acquaintance who could fence stolen goods and wanted to see them so he could fence a stolen ring. Hanratty wasn't sure precisely where this acquaintance lived in Liverpool and after a long and roundabout journey, he gave up trying to find this person. At 7.30pm, he caught the bus to Rill to find another acquaintance who could help him with the ring. Hanratty had been to Rill before, about a month prior, where he'd met this acquaintance before and had worked at a fairground briefly. This acquaintance had given Hanratty some shoes and it was with the agreement that Hanratty would pay for for them from his wages after working at the fairground, but Hanratty didn't pay for them, nor did he return to the fairground. It was questionable why Hanratty would want to see this again after he had essentially robbed and double-crossed him and deceived him. Why would he want to then do business with him? Hanratty said that he stayed at a boarding house in Rill and could provide accurate descriptions of the place, the layout, the content, and that he never found this elusive second acquaintance either. So he returned to Liverpool on the 24th of August in 1961, went to the cinema to watch, I believe it's pronounced, the guns of Navarone. He tried to go to see a boxing match, but then returned to London. Several witnesses from Liverpool and Rill were called to give evidence at the trial. When when Hanratty was alleged to have been looking for the first acquaintance in Liverpool, he had gone into a sweet shop to ask for directions. However, the shop owner said that the person who looked like Hanratty had gone into the shop on the 21st of August 1961. However, by Hanratty's own statement and Charles France, he was actually with Charles France and staying at the Vienna Hotel on that day. Other witnesses in Liverpool could not definitively place Hanratty in Liverpool on the date in question. And when it came to the evidence in real, it was also very shaky. 
Nagy. Hamrati said that he'd lied about his whereabouts at the time of the murder, as he was sure that nobody would be able to attest to him being there. But if he had been in Rill, and not with the three criminal associates who for sure would not be able to corroborate his presence in Liverpool was, as he was not there, then why would he say he was in Liverpool if he wasn't? The notion of him not being recognised in Rill is rubbish. Was he invisible? Did he hide the entire time and cover his face? If he stayed at a boarding house there, surely there would be evidence for this in the form of bookings and eyewitnesses. So why did he not go with this story if this was indeed the true story? And why was it only confirmed 12 days into a trial for murder. Hanratty confirmed he had stayed at a B&B in Kimmel Street in Rill called Ingledean. It was ran by a lady called Grace Jones and he accurately described the establishment by location and interior. She confirmed that a quote young man had stayed in room 4 at the B&B on the 22nd and 23rd of August in 1961 and she thought that this was Hanratty. However Mrs Jones could not provide books to prove this and agreed under cross-examination that the man could have stayed at the B&B from the 19th of August 1961. Additionally, the three rebuttal witnesses called by the prosecution confirmed that they had been staying at the B&B at the time of the murder and in the room that Mrs Jones said Hanratty had stayed. The police found that at the time from the witnesses that the B&B was so full that there was no room for Hanratty. What the police did not disclose, however, was that there was a room that was essentially a bathroom with a bed and could be used in emergencies and Hanratty could have stayed there. Also, contrary to the judge's instructions, Mrs Jones spoke with a man who was the alleged criminal associate in Rill. When she was questioned about her conversation with the man, she did not provide details of what was discussed. The police also made an allegation that when in custody, Hamrati had used the expression kip to say that he wanted to have a sleep. Hamrati said he never used this expression and he'd never admitted to a fellow prisoner while on remand that he'd committed the murder. In fact, two witnesses from the prison confirmed that this fellow prisoner had never been seen speaking to Hanratty. The jacket from the Hepworth suit was never found and alleged by the prosecution to have been the only item of clothing on which blood would have been deposited. It was found that in the Stanmore area, a black jacket had been stolen, which was consistent with Hamrati's testimony that he had committed a further break-in, had stolen the jacket to replace the Hepworth one that he had, quote, damaged. The star witness at the trial was, of course, Valerie Storey. She was wheeled in into court in a bed and placed in a chair to give evidence. She was very convincing and even turned to Han Ratty as he sat in court she turned to him and said you bastard you shot him why did you do that Valerie Story said that Han Ratty flinched when she said this the defense however greatly questioned Valerie Story's testimony she had very limited time to see the man's face and she had allegedly given a different description of the man to John Kerr than she had to the police. She had also misidentified the assailant at the first identity parade, but she was certain in the witness box that Han Ratty was indeed the man who had raped her and had murdered Michael Gregston. Another witness came forward during the trial and mentioned a name that had already been brought up in the investigation. Peter Louis Alphon. A lady called Mrs. Delau was robbed on the 7th of September 1961, and the person who robbed her said he was the A6 murderer. Alphon was one of the people that was put on the identity parade for this robbery, and she picked him out. This is not to dispute that the person who robbed her was indeed Alphon, but why did he make this supposed confession to Mrs. Delau? This may have been viewed as hearsay, so it wasn't pivotal to the case. Hamratty's family were waiting in a side room while the jury retired to consider its verdict. After three hours, the jury asked the judge to clarify the meaning of reasonable doubt. This gave Hamratty's supporters the hope that he would be found not guilty. However, their hope was dashed when, on the 17th of February 1962, the verdict came back as guilty. As was law at the time, the automatic sentence for the crime of murder was death. The judge donned the black cap and sentenced James Hanratty to death by hanging. After he was taken down, Hanratty's lawyer went to see him in the cells before being taken to prison. There, Hanratty and his lawyer agreed that they would appeal. The appeal was put before the Court of Criminal Appeal on the 13th of March in 1962. The basis of the appeal was not to present new evidence or even new line of inquiry, 
but rather that the defence team felt the jury had just not come to the right conclusion. Such an argument would not be successful because appeals need to be based on new evidence, or something compelling that a judge could reasonably conclude would have resulted in a different verdict if presented at a trial. Saying that a jury were just wrong isn't grounds for appeal. The defence also argued that the judge was biased, saying that in the summing up, the judge failed to highlight the evidence in James Hanratty's favour. Basically, they were saying that the jury were wrong and the judge's summing up was biased. The appeal was thrown out because just disagreeing with the jury's decision is not grounds for appeal without evidence. The allegations of the judge being biased against Han Ratty during the summing up were unfounded, as the jury's decision was based on the evidence and the witnesses rather than the summing up by the judge. James Han Ratty was hanged at Bedford Prison on the 4th of April in 1962, where he'd been incarcerated before, during and after the trial. This was not carried out without its problems, because many people believe James Han Ratty to have been innocent. A petition with 90,000 signatures was delivered to Parliament, but it was not enough to stall or stop the execution. The day before he was hanged, James Hanratty spoke with his parents and protested his innocence. James Hanratty was the eighth last person in the UK to be executed by the state, for the death penalty in the UK was suspended in 1965, made permanent in 1969, and finally abolished in 1998. The death penalty can no longer be reintroduced to the UK, so the automatic sentence for murder in the UK is life imprisonment. The last executions in the UK took place on the 13th of August in 1964. The names were Peter, Allen and Gwyn Evans, who were found guilty of the murder of a man called John West. The UK was divided over what had happened to James Ham Ratty, but so much to the point that the real victims in the case, Michael Gregston and Valerie Storey, were somewhat sidelined. The name of the convicted man became very familiar. Most people at the time had heard of James Ham Ratty, but very few had heard the name Michael Gregston. Michael Gregston's sons grew up not knowing their father, but their mother Janet Gregston told them all about Michael and what a brilliant father he was, and even Valerie attested to how much of a devoted father he was. His boys were his whole world. One of Michael's sons said that his mother talked about her late husband so much that he felt that he actually got to know his father despite him not physically being there. Valerie's story was heavily criticised. Many people believed her to have had made a huge mistake. Valerie's story Story was adamant that James Hanratty was the perpetrator. It was he who had carjacked her and Michael Gregston. It was he who had murdered Michael Gregston, and it was he who had raped her and tried to kill her. Campaigns were set up to clear Hanratty's name posthumously, and supporters had very noteworthy people attached to them, namely John Lennon and Yoko Ono. The Hanratty family garnered support for many, many years, and there was also someone who attended court who came forward years later and not only expressed their support for Hanratty family, but confessed to the crime, Peter Louis Alphon. Alphon allegedly went to the Hanratty home and spoke to the parents and the siblings. He said that he was the ASICS murderer, that the state had murdered their son. One of the brothers told Alphon to leave the house as his life may well be in danger. Alphon had actually also offered to compensate them for the loss of their son. There were protests, marches and much fuss made about the fact that Peter Louis Alphon had confessed. There were reports that Alphon was seen at the Station Inn at the same time as Michael Gregston and Valerie Storey before they drove to Dorney Reach. But because false confessions do happen, they do need to be tested, verified or falsified with corroborating evidence. Alphon was not charged because there was nothing linking him to the murder other than his confession. A group that called themselves the A6 Committee was set up to try and get James Hanratty's conviction quashed. A man called Paul Foot was part of this committee and he insinuated, although not categorically, that Janet Gregston had arranged to have her husband and his lover killed. Alphon had said that he been paid to murder Gregston and Story, and said that, quote, a man had done this, not a woman. In 1971, Alphon recanted his confession, but many people believed his admission to have been authentic. The Hanratty family and their supporters believed that ACOT, the officer that was in charge of the investigation, and the other officers had fitted Hanratty up. There were several arguments against Hanratty's guilt, which I will list here. His alibi of being in real was not completely debunked. He was a quote, professional car thief, but the perp drove the car poorly, even needing guidance from Valerie Storey, and to a lesser degree Michael Gregston, before murdering him as to how the Morris Miners gears worked. Valerie Storey 
picked out someone else first. Conflicting descriptions of the appearance of the driver of the Morris Minor by multiple eyewitnesses. No reason for Hanratty to have been in the area around Dorney Reach and unclear as to how he would have got there. He stood out when in the identity parade that would have drawn Valerie Story to him. His statements were retrospectively amended to make him look more guilty. There was also another potential person of interest. Charles France, James Hanratty's criminal associate and whose daughter Carol had dyed Hanratty's hair to help him commit more crimes. Charles France committed suicide two weeks prior to Hanratty's execution. He had made attempts on his life before, owing to a deep depression that had entered after finding out that his friend had committed this horrible crime. France could not accept that he'd allowed a person like Hanratty, whom he considered a really close friend, into his life and his home near his family. However, there has never been any evidence linking France to the murder, other than the anecdote that Hanratty told about the open seat at the back of the A6 bus. It also came out that there were several pieces of evidence known to the police that were never disclosed to the defence, which may have been enough to have placed reasonable doubt in the jury members' minds to find James Hanratty not guilty. In order to be acquitted in a court of law, you don't necessarily have to be found to be innocent of the crime. There just has to be enough reasonable doubt. That's enough for you to be found not guilty if the jury agrees. That doesn't mean you didn't do it, it just means that there's not enough evidence presented in court to confirm that it was you beyond a reasonable doubt because the burden of proof lies with the prosecution. The pieces of evidence that were not disclosed to the defence included more eyewitnesses from all over the country that saw the Morris Minor at places that conflicted with the times and sightings of the people in Ilford. Michael Hanratty, James Hanratty's younger brother, said that Oxford and Acott, the two detectives in charge of the case, knew that the car was not in Ilford at 7am but did not disclose that to the defence. These allegations include another light grey Morris Minor was parked on the opposite side of the road to where Michael Gregston's car was eventually found in Avondale Crescent that morning, a car belonging to a woman called Doreen Milne. Doreen Milne said that she did not notice an identical car on the other side of the road. At 6.30am, a man called William Lee saw a grey Morris Minor being driven by a man wearing a woolen pom-pom hat on the A6 near Matlock in Derbyshire. The reg number was noted as 847BHN. This was the same reg as Michael Gregston's car. Gregston did keep a hat of this description in the boot of the car, but this sighting by William Lee was the only time at which a man was sighted wearing that hat in the car. At 12 midday on the 23rd of August, which is much later in the day than the car was supposed to have been parked in Ilford, a man called John Douglas, who worked as a petrol pump attendant in Burstall, north of Leicester, said he saw a bluish gray car although he did not write it down, he said that the reg number was 847BHN and was occupied by a man and a woman. Mr. Douglas said that the man spoke with a Somerset type accent. There were multiple sightings of a car with the same reg number at 1pm that day in Hitchin in St. Ippolitz, which was close to Bedford. Another sighting of the car was given at 5.25pm in Coventry, but this couldn't have been the case as Michael Gregston's car had since been apprehended by the police in Avondale Crescent by that time. A lady called Margaret Thompson saw the police around a quote grey Morris 1000 at 8pm in the evening of the 23rd of August 1961 and said that at 5.30pm when she had also passed that street it had not been there. The family have since tried again and again to get James Hanratty's conviction quashed after his execution. In 2002, an appeal was launched. In the 2002 appeal, it was observed that the sightings in Matlock, Coventry and north of Leicester that were not disclosed to the defence were in no doubt in conflict with the sightings in Eastern Avenue and Avondale Crescent at 7am that morning. It would be hard to determine why the murderer had gone all over the country like this to and from Ilford given that he would have known that the police would be looking for that vehicle. There was another very crucial piece of evidence found. Michael Gregston was a scientist. He was an astute and accomplished mathematician. He kept a record of the mileage in the car after every single journey, every time he put the petrol in it. Michael Gregston had recorded that on the 22nd of August in 1961, the meter showed 51,000 
875 miles. However, what Gregston hadn't done was record the time and location of where the petrol was administered. It was unclear as to when the reading on that day was recorded, but when the car was recovered by the police, the mileage on the meter was 52,107 miles. This was a total of 232 miles that the Morris miner had travelled from the time that Michael Gregston had put petrol in the car when he'd recorded it, whenever that was, and when the car was found. Valerie Story testified that the car had almost a full tank when the perpetrator made them drive off from Dorney Reach. Gregston must have filled up the car just before picking up Valerie's story from work. Wherever this petrol station was, Michael Gregston must have driven from that location to his and Valerie's place of work, to the old station inn, then to Dorney Reach. The shortest distance from Dorney Reach to Deadman's Hill is between 58 and 65 miles, and the shortest distance from Deadman's Hill to Avondale Crescent was 48.6 miles. That is a minimum of 106.6 miles, but does not include anything that Michael Gregston did earlier that day after obtaining petrol, nor does it take into account the real possibility that the perpetrator drove for quite some time and for a few hours may have intended to drive to certain locations but got rather lost. Also, he made Gregston and Valerie drive around for a long time too. This recording of mileage was one of the items not disclosed by the police to the defence at the time of the 1962 trial, and it was grounds for appeal in 2002. However, in the 2002 appeal, it was observed that no real doubt could be deduced from these mileage recordings. In fact, it was counterproductive to the appeal because it was used to discredit the sightings of the Morris Minor in more northern places because driving there and back would have meant the car's journey would have been greatly excess of 232 miles. The conclusion of these aspects during the 2002 appeal was that no real determination could be drawn now, nor could they have assumed as to what the defence would have done with this evidence as it did not categorically confirm their client's innocence. It was expressed at the 2002 appeal that there was no compelling evidence contained within these non-disclosed documents that would have rendered the conviction unsafe. Just because there are reports that do not cooperate with the evidence does not nullify the evidence. The police need to go through the sightings and find which ones are credible. It's possible that the police were following the train of thought called confirmation bias and only selected reported sightings that confirmed where the Morris Minor was found. It's possible that the other sightings were discounted not because of confirmation bias, but because of the process of elimination. A car cannot defy time and physics and teleport, so if a car is seen in one location, and another 50 miles away five minutes later, it cannot be both true. But it is the case that all information, whether or not the police believed it, should have been disclosed to the defence. All of this should have been disclosed to the defence, and it wasn't for the police to determine whether the defence would have used it and what they would have done with it, but it was found 40 years after the trial that if the information had been disclosed to the defence, it probably wouldn't have done them any favours at all. Four decades had passed between one of the most groundbreaking and innovative tests of modern science could finally put this matter to bed. DNA testing. Two items containing the murderer's DNA, the handkerchief found with the revolver and Valerie Story's underwear. Previously, back in 1961, the semen stain in Valerie Story's underwear was able to yield a blood type of the secretor. It was found to be type O. This was Han Ratty's blood type, but 40% of the male population is type O, as was Peter Louis Alphon. Gregston wasn't type O, that ruled him out, so this semen did belong to the perpetrator. Before launching the appeal in 2002, there was a police inquiry as to whether or not this case had been handled appropriately. It was concluded that this was a case of wrongful conviction, and a posthumous appeal was launched as a result of that inquiry in 1997. In the 90s, DNA testing of these two items, the nasal fluid on the handkerchief and the semen in the underwear, were attempted, but there wasn't enough DNA there to yield a profile. But in 2001, a further breakthrough in DNA testing was made called PCR. Strands of DNA are shown as two identical strands that spiral around each other and are linked by certain proteins in the middle of these two strands. PCR splits the strand, the double strand, into two single strands and using an enzyme duplicates each single strand to turn it into another double strand. Those strands are split, duplicated repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly so that multiple strands of DNA can be made from the tiniest amounts of DNA. Even just one cell can 
be multiplied multiple times to create a DNA profile using PCR. The DNA from both exhibits, the handkerchief and Valerie Story's underwear, were subjected to PCR protocols. When the two DNA profiles were logged, they were compared and confirmed that they 100% matched one another. Therefore, the possibility that they came from the same person is 1 in 100 million. Consequently, the person who handled the gun around which the handkerchief was wrapped also raped Valerie Story and killed Michael Gregston. It is worth noting though that only one male DNA profile was found on these exhibits. James Hamratty's mother and brother provided samples of their DNA and expected this to confirm once and for all that James Hamratty was not the A6 murderer. However, when the results came back, it showed that the DNA found on both exhibits bore a familial match to the DNA supplied by the brother and the mother. Therefore, the DNA was from a family member and was confirmed to either be a sibling of the brother or a son of the mother. The Hanratty family were outraged. They had been convinced for decades that James Hanratty did not commit the murder. An application was made to exhume James Hanratty's body, which the family at first did not agree to. An exhumation was nonetheless ordered and DNA from one of James Hanratty's teeth was extracted. It was compared to the DNA from the two exhibits and it was a perfect match. In 2002, a judge presiding over the appeal made decades after the A6 murder stated that the DNA confirmed Hanratty's guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. The judge made the comment that the DNA alone was enough to confirm guilt, but there were other corroborating pieces of evidence too. There were those though that believed the DNA was also false. The Hanratty family believed that the only way the DNA showed Hanratty's profile was due to contamination. Back in the 1960s, DNA was not ever thought of as being a tool of forensic testing or evidence, and both of these aforementioned exhibits and Hanratty's own clothing were stored in the same boxes without anything to protect them from one another. Michael Hanratty pointed out that the police and anyone else handling all the items didn't use gloves nor have sanitary equipment. They believed that the DNA from Hanratty's clothing had got onto the two exhibits and this was how his DNA was found on them. Scientists conceded that DNA testing is not infallible and contamination is always a possibility. However, on this occasion, they were certain that contamination had not been responsible for the result. The reasons for this are as follows. Only one male DNA profile was found on Valerie Story's underwear, yielded from the semen. Only one male DNA profile was found on the handkerchief, yielded from mucus. If any seminal fluid was present on James Hanratty's clothes, it is possible that there may have been transferred to the underwear, but this would not mean the semen from another perpetrator would be erased. If accidental or even deliberate direct rubbing from an area from Hanratty's trousers or even his own underwear on these items had occurred, the original DNA would have been present and embedded within the fabrics of the exhibits. Any genetic material that may have been deposited from Hanratty would show as being layered on top of the original. The same goes for the mucus. Contamination would not have eradicated the DNA already on the sample. A vial of evidential items had been broken and could account for contamination but again, it is with the assumption that DNA had gone onto the exhibits, consumed and eradicated any trace of any other DNA. The family and defense lawyer argued that the passage of time meant that the items, quote, did not satisfy modern evidential standards and had to be subject to PCR to yield DNA. However, that's exactly what PCR is for. The family and defense lawyer said that the DNA would not have survived the 40 years, but strangely, this would mean that they believe that Hanratty's own DNA from his own clothing had survived. They believe Hanratty has been framed and the case covered up. However, they accused the original police in charge of doing this, who had no idea about future DNA technology at the time. The 1997 police inquiry had already established a strong case of wrongful conviction and had taken it to the court of appeal, so there would have been nothing to gain by by falsifying results. Whilst it is possible that there was some corrupt police work here and evidence that there was such, ultimately the guilty man was found and executed. The Hanratty family, Paul Foote and many other people still believe James Hanratty to have been innocent of this crime, but there has never been any proof nor compelling evidence to nullify every other piece of evidence. The BBC documentary The A6 Murder states the following, 40 years ago a small time thief called James Hanratty with no history of violent crime was hanged for a motiveless and horrific murder. There's no such thing as a motiveless murder. Most of the time, motives are 
love, money, revenge, or simply a thrill killing. This was likely a thrill killing. Also, James Hamratty was not a small time thief. James Hamratty was a 25 year old man who had been housebreaking and stealing cars for years, having had two stints in prison and betraying his parents. And those are only crimes for which we're aware. Psychopaths often start small, and they start with really small things such as pinching a few sweets. They move on to bigger and more daring things, sometimes includes confidence trickery, deception, and blatant disregard for anyone's safety or well-being. As their skills increase, they become more sophisticated, their confidence and specialities evolve. They don't just do it for the money, they do it for the thrill. As they keep doing the same crime, the high dies down. Like many people who find themselves addicted to things, they need something stronger and they move on to harming people directly, either psychologically, sexually, or physically by having control over another person. Taking away someone's life is to play God. It's to have the ultimate control over somebody. After the DNA evidence was revealed, Michael Hanratty said the following, this thing has gone on for 40 years. They covered it up and this is the final cover up. Valerie Story said, I wish to state positively and categorically that there was no miscarriage of justice. There never was any such miscarriage of justice. Valerie Story died aged 77 on the 26th of March in 2016. She never married nor had children and she stayed living at the house where she'd been born. But she still lived a very full life afterwards, even though she was in a wheelchair. She went back to work as a scientist. She did a lot of work for people who were disabled and was greatly praised for her bravery over this. And Michael Gregston's two sons, they still to this day remember and talk about their father as their mother had told them all about him. Do you think James Hamratty was innocent or guilty? Please be respectful of everybody in the comments and I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much, little berries. Bye!